So we are talking back to school. It is August. Yep, it Holy is. Holy cow. Everyone is back. A lot of teachers are back to school already. Working yeah, they are. Preparing for the school Getting year. Getting their classrooms all set up. Yep. So nice. it is It is time to either celebrate or be sad, depending on the age of your child or children. Right. Some parents are like counting down the hours. Others are dreading it because their babies are going off to school. Exactly. Um, but at the end of the day, it's back to school time. So it sure is. So we, we can't deny that. Talk about some different things that you want to make sure you're aware of and um, practicing in order to prepare you for back to school. If you have a student with a learning disability or you're an individual with a learning disability, uh, we want to make sure that you are equipped for going back to school. It is um, right around the corner, but there's still time to prepare. So you're not too late. Hopefully we're talking about this early enough that if you haven't already contacted the school or kind of put your plan in place, you still have plenty of time. So I guess let's start with if you have a student that was receiving services of any kind um, at the end of last year, whether that was services under special education or services under 504, really even if they were getting any kind of RTI, I would mm -hmm. think too, yeah. which is that response, response to intervention. intervention. I think the most important thing is that right now you know how to locate and can find a copy of their plan, whichever plan it is that they have, that you can put your hands on it because that's going to be your point of reference. And you're going to want to make sure that the teachers that are going to be teaching your child this coming school year have a copy of that. And so while you may not know who your child's teacher is, it's a good idea to get that paperwork ready. And as soon as you find out, it is absolutely okay to get mm -hmm. that information and email it to them. Now, it's assumed that the school is going to provide all this information to the teacher, right? Right. And they but should be. think about having a classroom full of brand new kids, whether you've got 18 kids in your class or you've got 25 kids in your class. It's a lot of stuff to juggle. And they're handed all these papers. And, and it, honestly, things get lost in the shuffle to no one's fault. They do. Or they're in a pile on their desk where they might not get to that pile for a few weeks because they've been inundated with so much paperwork. So it is absolutely okay to email the school counselor a copy of your child's individual accommodation plan or their individualized education plan and ask if you can find out who the teachers are so that you can contact the teachers. If you can't get into if you can't find out who the teachers are until back to school night or the day before school starts or sometimes it's a few days before as soon as you do find out who those teachers are I would encourage you to open that line of communication with the teachers email them let them know who you are who your child is and let them know what your child's strengths and weaknesses are absolutely and the accommodations that are in place that help them be more successful and the supports they need and in this their learning style even I that's think so it's, important it's good to say you know my child does best with hands-on learning or does best with visual learning or my child does great sitting near the front of the classroom or doesn't do well near other kids that yeah this this student them. is their best friend so if you could keep them separated that's probably a exactly, good idea. Exactly. Exactly. Teachers appreciate that information. You know, they, it takes them a while to, to really understand the kids and develop that kind of understanding. So for you to lay that out there ahead of time, while some parents feel like that's not like I don't need to, you know, I'm overstepping my boundaries, mm -hmm. it is absolutely very helpful for them. So I think it's huge it for you to send that information ahead of time. For students that are a little bit older, and I would say probably late elementary and middle school and high school, it's important for them to know what kinds of things to expect. What are they... Um, and what are they going to be getting this year as far as accommodations go and mm -hmm. what is it going to look like for them so that they can also learn how to start advocating for themselves. Absolutely. And so this is a great time to have that conversation with your child and say, okay, you know, this year we've got these things in place. Um, get, you know, they should have been part of that meeting, may, maybe or maybe not, right. but getting their input as far as what they feel like works best and what they're comfortable with. But we, we have so many kids that come in and, and especially the older students who are embarrassed mm -hmm. because it's it hasn't been made okay right. to get, those, to get accommodations. those accommodations. So it's important to start. I think you can have little practice sessions about talking how they're going to approach their teacher to ask for an accommodation or to That's remind their teacher that they are entitled to a specific accommodation. You know, if the teacher passes out tests 
and your child is supposed to go test in the testing center or in a small group setting, you know, you want to talk to your child about how can be how how would be an appropriate way that they can bring that to the attention of the teacher that Miss so and so I'm supposed to go to the testing center or I'm supposed to have my test read. So I think it is very important to make sure your child is able to advocate for their own needs. They're aware of their accommodations mm -hmm. that they have in their plan. They understand the upon. benefit of them too. That's right. They understand the benefit so that they're not afraid to have it and to ask for it or that they're not going to decline it. Because I've in the past worked with students that for instance were supposed to get oral administration of their tests tests read to them and they just would keep going ahead without <laughs> waiting for me no, to read it to yeah. them and they're like no thank you I've got it I've got it and I have to explain to them but we have shown that you perform better mm -hmm. you do much better when you get it read to you so even if you want to go ahead when I get to question two come back to question two and listen to me read it out loud and read along as I read it aloud. Um, I think too if, if over the summer something has changed you know you had this certain plan when school ended it sounded great but over the summer you've done extra tutoring or so, something along the ways has you know or the child has decided mm -hmm. they want they want it to look different then when you um, email that plan to the teachers you want to make sure you include the the administrator, so that might be the counselor or the special education team leader or whoever your, principal. whoever your contact person is for those meetings and, and is kind of the leader of your um, committee meetings. Mm -hmm. You want to include them and let them know that your, your child and you have decided that you'd like to maybe tweak some things and go ahead and lay that out for them because again, it's going to take a little while for that meeting to happen because right. it's the beginning of the school year. And so if the teacher already knows, okay, it says here that they're supposed to get XYZ, but he really wants... PDQ, they can start implementing some of that stuff knowing that knowing, it's coming eventually right. in the paperwork. So, And I think it's also important to realize for parents of students with learning disabilities, ADHD, any type of learning difference, that parents have rights and even if your annual meeting to review your students plan is not due let's say until November you can call a meeting at any time whether it be a 504 meeting or an IEP meeting for special education what's sometimes called in Texas we call them ARD or ARD meetings um, ARD committee meetings so if your student is receiving special education services there's an annual anniversary date when they are due at the latest to have a review of their individualized education plan you do not have to wait until that do, that date comes around mm -hmm. to review the plan if like Lori said things have changed or progress has been different or you've gone through a new intervention program and you want to tweak something in the plan call a meeting email the coordinator email the counselor email the diagnostician the 504 coordinator whoever's in charge and request that you would like to meet as soon as possible to review your child's plan and I think that's perfectly acceptable and I think that is you're right most people think that they just have to wait until the school calls them for the meeting mm -hmm. but you can call a meeting anytime you want absolutely and, and if you request it it's gonna happen so mm -hmm. so okay so let's say that over the summer you have a student that is newly diagnosed and you just have new testing and you've had a diagnosis happen over the summer and now you need to put these plans in place you don't have a plan from last year now you're ready for a plan right so if you haven't already Send that stuff off to the school counselor. It's usually yes. a great place to start, or your right. vice principal, mm -hmm. um, and let them know you've had testing done. Here, we're you know, and kind of in, in a in a summary paragraph here, where the you know the diagnosis is this, and here are some of the things we're looking for: five hundred four special education. Here's a copy of that report. When can we meet? What's the first date we can meet? In the same breath, just like with with before, if you as soon as you find out the teacher, again, you're not going to have that meeting for a couple of weeks probably. probably but it's okay to let the teacher know look we had testing done this summer and it turns out that Susie has dyslexia and our goal is that she'll start the dyslexia program when it starts um, but in the interim here are some things we just want you to be aware mm -hmm. of and I think that leads me to another conversation really quick too about some of those services parents can sometimes get frustrated because you know, like Dyslexia therapy doesn't always start on the first day of school. It doesn't usually. Speech therapy doesn't always right. start on the first day of school. Right. It takes a little time for them to get kind of, they that get the kids situated. Get, get scheduled. Schedules worked out. Mm -hmm. New kids come in. Right. Um, so don't be frustrated if you if you have a child that's receiving some kind of service yeah. and it doesn't usually start on the first day. Usually by the 
second week of school, they have a schedule in place where they know that they're going to pull them at this time for 45 minutes a day or for speech, they're going to see them on Tuesdays and Thursdays yeah. for 30 minutes or OT. It or doesn't PT. take long, but it's just never the first day. It's rarely the first day, which is okay because students need that first week to learn the routines, learn the procedures, get to know their peers in their classroom, get to know their teachers, build rapport with everybody. And they I think, yeah, there. and I think speaking of routines at home, this is the time to start kind of planning your home routine. What's it going to look like the night before um, in the evenings, getting mm -hmm. getting everything organized for school every day, not just the first day of school. So where are we going to keep backpacks? Where are we going to leave lunches? Where are we going to make sure all of our signed forms and returned papers? Start talking about and looking at what's going to work best. Some people like to leave it by the door where they leave every morning mm -hmm. out, the, out of the garage. Some people have a space in the kitchen, a filing system, something to help everybody stay organized. When you start that from day one right. um, and your student has a little bit of input as to what they like and what works best, you're more likely to have success than to throw it into place, sure. you know, in September or October and, and, you know, demand that this new system take place. Yep, you want, you want your child to have some input in that. So what's going to work best for them? Yeah, they'll buy into it more with the more input they have in where do you want to keep your backpack and where do you want your folders to but go? Don't you think and that's one of the things we hear the most is parents frustrated with losing losing things. losing things their backpacks a mess they can't mm -hmm. they can't you know find their homework or they didn't turn it in they didn't turn it in they didn't i know they did school. it but they just didn't turn it in so if you start establishing those routines now and even just not with homework but like bedtime routines and mm -hmm. and morning right. routines oh mornings. homework routines yeah have a set a set designated place either in their bedroom in the kitchen in the dining room but have a designated spot in the house that it's going to be that's going to be the homework spot and make sure that it's free of distractions. Make sure there's plenty of pencils and erasers so that your child isn't all, you know, using those avoidance <laughs> behaviors, getting <laughs> up, I need broke. a new pencil, I need a new marker, I need a crown, I need a pencil sharpener, I need paper. Keep all the necessary supplies in that homework area. Um, it's good to have a clock or a timer. A timer's great. A timer's a great thing. It's a great tool to use to set for any age student that struggles with time management and executing tasks through to completion, set a timer and say, you're going to work for 15 minutes. And when the timer goes off, you can take a five minute break and then set a timer even for the break that when the timer rings again, your break is over and it's time to get back to homework. Or and reading. I think something to think about too, again, I feel like this is like showing our ADHD because I'm jumping from topic to topic because I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. But something to think about as we go into the school year is we get a lot of questions about how long, how, how much time should my kids spend on homework? Mm -hmm. How long should homework take? And really the rule of thumb, which doesn't always apply, it should be 10 minutes per grade level. So if you're a first grader, 10 minutes, a second grader, 20 minutes, a third grader, 30 minutes. Kindergartner, five minutes, maybe. They shouldn't really have homework, but right, yeah. I know they do. Now, obviously, there's going to be days there's more, there's going to be days there's less, but that should be your, your average. Mm -hmm. So when your child is spending way more time than that, it's or less, line. way less. <laughs> or way less. That could be a red flag too, it right? Could be. Right. Like, hmm, how'd you get that done so fast? And you might want to reach out. That's a good time to reach out to the teacher and say, you know, how much homework should we be expecting? How much time should we be expecting little Susie to be working on homework? Um, and if you are having to work through it with your child. If they're struggling tremendously on homework, being able to do it independently or with a little bit of guidance, that's an area of concern that you want to put kind of on your concerns list if you haven't already developed a concerns list because homework is more practice what's been taught. It shouldn't be learning a brand new skill. So homework is reinforcing skills that were taught during the day at school. If your child is really struggling with homework and they're not able to do it, then you want to reach out to the teacher and, and have a conversation with the teacher about what why, it, why yeah. is yeah, why is little Johnny struggling so much with homework? And and the homework routine and putting things in place, um, on that note, I also Turn wanted back. to say back to that, 
is that I think it's important to develop organizational systems oh, sure. in, in addition to establishing those routines. So having a giant calendar either on the wall or on a desk where you're going to put projects and assignments and due dates and help your child. It's a lifelong skill that everyone has to work on with time management and organization skills. And they may have an agenda book or a planner that they're going to use and they may be that efficient student that writes down everything off the board that the teacher gives them, but they may not. They may be taking pictures of the information. But have somewhere in the house that you're going to help guide your student um, or yourself if you're older at being organized and being able to plan ahead so that you can look ahead to what's coming up. Well, I think too, relying on, um, it's okay to, to, to some extent to rely on the information the school provides. I think these days That's that true. everything's online and you should be able to go somewhere to find out where the homework assignments are mm -hmm. and what's due tomorrow and when the next test is. And it's okay um, to to guide your child through that process. Let's go look together. Let's write mm -hmm. that, oh, you've got a test, let's write that down on the calendar so we remember it and we know we need to start studying for it. You want to start creating those routines and those habits so that someday when you send this child off to school or off to college, they already know, oh, I need to plan for this test and this is how I'm going to do it because this is how, I, how I've always done right. it. Exactly. So establishing those routines and those strategies early on is huge. And most teachers these days have web pages yeah. also that you can access a lot of information about their class, their curriculum, upcoming projects and assignments. And again, back to communication, it is crucial to have that open communication between home and school. So if you do have a question, don't hesitate to email the teacher. Um, calling is hard because they're teaching all day long right. during the day and so they might not check voicemail until the end of the day. They might not get back to you until the following day. You know. So email is the best way I think to reach out to teachers but keep that open line of communication and good collaboration between home and school. And if you are struggling with getting emails back, um, send a written note with your child mm -hmm. and just, I mean, hope that they get it. But yeah, but that to me is like, because phone idea. calls I think are are not productive. No. I just think teachers are busy and I think do we I mean I think they all have phones in their room still but yes. I mean I don't know that they would I don't think they answer. There's just them. no time. And they, even during their planning period or their conference period, they have so many things to do, meetings to attend, planning sessions, collaboration with their teams. They don't have time to make phone calls. Emails are much easier to check when your your kids are doing independent work or you're giving a test or it's silent reading time. Um, they can or write during, during planning, their planning time, yeah. time. They can respond to an email much quickly, much quicker than a phone call. So if you have a college student that is headed off to college um, here in the next couple of weeks, because that is happening really soon too, and they have a learning disability, ADHD, something that they've been getting accommodations for. I know we've talked about it before, but you can absolutely get those same accommodations at college. Um, but it is super important today to reach out to what is probably called the Disability Services Office at your school. I want to say it's Disability Services, Disability Support. Mm -hmm. um, accessibility Services sometimes. Sometimes Accessibility, but it's going to be in that. If you just Google Disability Services for your college, you'll find the contact information. You'll want to send a copy of the assessment report. Your student is going to be driving that bus. They won't talk to you unless your student signs a consent form because they are now an adult. Mm -hmm. But the sooner you can get in contact with them and get a meeting set up and get that accommodation plan developed, the less time they'll go without it when school starts. And they can get the same kinds of accommodations, Absolutely. extra time to finish their tests, a quiet place to take their tests, copies of lecture notes, yeah, ability huge. to record um, lectures, audio record the lectures. Um, I just had one and I forgot it. What am I thinking? Oh, audio books. Audio books. Oh, or, yeah, audio books. Text, tests read to them. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is all there and it's available. So take advantage of it. And to me, that's you don't have any idea, especially if you're going off for the first time to college. You don't know what to college is so different than high school. The kids don't know what to expect. Right. And they think, well, I didn't really use that very much in high school, so I don't think I'm going to need it. Mm -mm. Put it in place. Put it in place. Because no one and 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 I think this is where the av advocacy piece comes in so much for them because no one's going to chase them down if they forgot to go to the testing center. Right. Right it's just not going to happen. And so they have to be willing to advocate and say, my test goes to the testing center. You know, for all college students, I think it's so important to build a relationship with your professors. And so many it students is. think that's so dorky, but it is so important. It makes, it a, makes huge a huge difference. difference. It but really especially does. if you're getting accommodations, you mm -hmm. have to 
go and introduce yourself to your professor the first week of class. Um, talk to them about your accommodations and how they are helpful to you right. and how they how your needs. Yeah, your I just needs are. build that relationship with them. That is huge. And I think at the end of the semester when grades are being assigned, I do think it does make a really big difference. It really does make a big difference. And I think they're they're more inclined to make sure that you're giving the accommodations you need if they've had that face to face interaction with you. They know that you're advocating for your own needs, that you're motivated to do well that you're taking charge right it does and the initiative yeah. the initiative it does say a lot and some of those disability services programs are very bare bones they offer these sets of accommodations it's this is this is it others are very robust mm -hmm. and they offer um, some tutoring and they might offer some um, seminars rooms, quiet study right rooms. study rooms they might offer some study skills study skills so find teaching. out what they offer and I mean take advantage of everything we have a question. So I just had a comment oh. somebody sent in. Her name is Brandy, and she wrote us a message about uh, accommodations. Oh, good. And she said, I hope that every young one gets to know about reasonable accommodations, as you said, and advocate for themselves for the rest of their lives. This took me literally until my adulthood to realize for myself. I have read and write on my workstations for my learning disabilities, and I wish I hadn't taken my entire life of being ashamed <laughs> of my disability. Aww. We understand. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Brandy. That's awesome. Good for you. But yes, you're exactly right. It is. It they are um, offered for a reason, mm -hmm. and it is not um, taking a shortcut. It's not it's unfair. Not it's, it's actually not unfair. Is what makes everything fair. Yep. Exactly. So, it makes things equal. And it levels the playing field is what those accommodations and supports do. If you have a disability, what it's doing is it's leveling the playing field and giving you access to the same things that everyone else has access to and ability to demonstrate your knowledge to the best of your ability. It's really no different than us wearing glasses. Exactly. Right? It's just allowing mm -hmm. us to see more clearly. It's not giving us an unfair advantage. Right. It's just helping us see like people that don't need glasses see. Right. So I or think pu giving, putting a wheelchair ramp outside buildings, that is something that is giving accessibility to those that are in wheelchairs for them to have access. Not to unfair. The it's so for you to have access to performing well on your test, you might need extra time on your test and that's okay. Or you might need noise canceling headphones if you're distracted by you know, background noise going on around you or copies of lecture notes. But really, any any university or college, if you go to their website, they all have a search bar at the top of the front page of the website. And if you put in that search bar, disability services, it, whatever that office is called for that university or that college, that campus, that link will come up and it'll take you to the link to that part of the website and you can find out what documentation is needed to submit to request accommodation. Sometimes it's a one-page application along with proof of your disability, so an evaluation from school or from a private evaluation practice like us. Um, that might be all you need, but you want to reach out and as soon as possible and submit that necessary documentation. Yeah, absolutely. And and here's the great thing about colleges is that if you have ADHD and you never really used accommodations all through high school, but now in college you're thinking, wow, I'm, I think I might need them. As long as you have that documentation and you fill out the application, they're not going to say, well, you didn't use them in high school. So yes, that's great. This is right. a whole new, whole new game. So you absolutely can then receive those accommodations in college. You don't have to have had received them in, in high school. Right. So, but they do want to see a current evaluation. Yeah, they and do. So that is important to know. Don't be surprised if your child was evaluated and diagnosed with dyslexia in say second, third grade, and they've been receiving accommodations throughout school, or they haven't been receiving accommodations because they had a really successful intervention program and they just have learned great coping strategies. Um, you need to know that the school is going to want a current evaluation within the last three years. So even though we know dyslexia doesn't go away, colleges are going to want to see documentation that's current that documents. So we've that, heard, that. I've had some schools that are like within the last 18 months. It's, it's, so check with, again, when you check get to that disability services site. website, um, it'll all that's of their requirements. I know, that's so silly. That is but, silly. Um, so really quick, um, 
one other thing I just kind of wanted to touch on, if you ended last year with some concerns mm. and you just saw some stuff that you were like, gosh, I feel like this is could be a problem. And then the school year ended and we had summer and summer's been great. Everyone's traveled this year. It's been awesome. But now school's starting and you're like, oh, here we go. I wonder if the reading thing is still an issue. I wonder if the math thing is still an issue. And you're probably wondering, well, I wonder how long I should give it before mm -hmm. I do something about it. Not very long is our advice. Mm -hmm. I would say exactly. the minute you see the struggles resurfacing, let's do something about it because that just means that we're falling further and further behind. Exactly. Gaps are getting bigger. Gaps are growing. Confidence is failing. Self-esteem is suffering. Suffering. For um, sure. And I think, you know, in what we do in working with kids of all ages, we see a lot of those secondary issues that mm -hmm. come about when you've struggled academically. Mm -hmm. Um, you do. Your self-esteem takes a hit. You start to develop some anxiety, sometimes some depression. Mm -hmm. And the earlier you, you intervene, ugh, mm -hmm. the earlier you intervene, the less likely those things are to occur. That's right. Or there's less just to undo. Early intervention is key. So it, don't wait. You know, give give it four weeks. And if you see those concerns, those struggles arise, communicate with the teacher. Talk to the school counselor. Ask for a meeting. Ask for a parent-teacher conference. That's a great place to start is meet with the teacher. Like what's happening in school? What's Why? going on? What are on? you guys seeing? Yeah. What are you seeing? How does my child compare to their peers in the same grade level? They seem behind to me. Do they seem behind right. to you, the teacher? And what can we do about it? What's being put in place at school right now? You know, sometimes they are doing small group interventions, pulling kids back to the teacher table and doing one-on-one -on -one interventions or re-explaining, re re-instructing. But even if the school's like, well, we don't really see any problems, what often happens is that they're waiting for them to fail. Mm -hmm. I hate that. They're waiting for them to fail yeah. before they're going to jump in. You don't have to wait for that. No. You can do something before then. So don't feel like you have to wait until the school says, okay, we'll act or we're right. ready. And then, and then your child has failed. And again, self-esteem, right. all of those things, plus just the gaps have gotten bigger. So, exactly. you know, sometimes they they think everything's hunky dory, but you see the one-on-one -on -one at home. So many times kids can mask it at school. That's so, true. but can. you do want to find out what they're together. seeing for sure. And be your child's advocate, be their voice, especially for the younger ones. For the younger ones. Um, reach out, communicate, call a meeting, email whoever you need to email, the counselor, the assistant principal. Um, if you know, if your child is in special education, they most likely have a case manager, reach out to the case manager. Maybe they're not getting the appropriate supports they need in order to be successful. So reach out. Yeah. So if you guys have any other questions about learning disabilities, dyslexia, ADHD, you can visit our website, diagnostic-learning.com. Abby and I also have a podcast called Let's Talk Learning Disabilities. We just did a whole back to school episode that just air, uh, just dropped. Is that what we say? Just, just was released this week. <laughs> um, and we've got some great guests lined up for the next couple of weeks. But um, and 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 feel free to call us. We um, love to talk. Obviously, we we're still talking. We do love to talk. Here we go. But um, we're happy to talk to anyone with any questions. Yeah, we want to help. That's why we're here. So diagnostic-learning.com. Um, or our Facebook group, Let's Talk Learning Disabilities. Oh, yeah. okay. Keep thinking yeah. about that. Yeah. And the podcast, Let's Talk Learning Disabilities. So That's thank you guys for us. joining us tonight. Hope you have a good evening and a good last few days of summer. Yeah. And good luck with and back to have school. Have a great school year. All right, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.